I've tried a little bit of everything in terms of uh, performance enhancing drugs. Insulin, growth hormone, testosterone, trenbolone, anadrol, anavar, dianabol, all that stuff. I would say probably the like one of the worst ideas I had was to... Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. Today, it's my honor to announce today's guest is Mark Bell, an elite pro powerlifter, host of the Power Project podcast, owner of the Slingshot and Super Training Gym, and two-time Ultimate Pro Wrestling Champion. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Mark. It's an absolute honor to have you on. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. By the way, is the Super, G, uh, the super Training Gym free? It is, yeah. We've had Super Training Gym since 2006, and uh, first opportunity I had to make the gym free, that was something that was important to me. It wasn't always free. It wasn't free right when, right when it started, but I wanted to make it free and give people uh, an opportunity to train and to uh, kind of lower the barrier of entry into training. That's really been my kind of mission for the last, you know, two decades or so is to invite people into fitness, invite people into training and have them just understand like, uh, it doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to be so complicated. I think people's diets are too hard. Their workouts are too hard. Their, uh, their runs are too hard. This is too hard. That's too hard. And they're trying to cram it into their day-to-day -day life. And then, uh, and then they fall off with it. It's the one thing that can kind of be fleeting. They can let it go. They can't let it go their nine to five job and so on. But uh, I've always felt it's important for people to stay tethered to fitness and nutrition in some way. Uh, even if there's the smallest efforts, even if it's just like you're going on a couple walks uh, a couple times a week and you uh, cut back on sugar, you know, just a small change for most people will end up having a, a huge impact because so many people are eating, uh, eating like way off plan or they've never been on a plan yeah. before. And so I just see too many people uh, just trying to make everything way too difficult. And something I've noticed is that when it comes to getting stronger or when it comes to building muscle uh, or when it comes to even just losing some body fat, none of these things are actually that hard. Uh, they do take a concentrated effort, but I just see too many people out of the gate. They, they go way too hard and then they don't, they're not able to develop any sort of habits and then because they don't have the habits, they don't have the consistency. So having a free gym and just kind of lowering barriers of entry into other forms of fitness has always been important to me. I think that's awesome, man. Honestly, thank you for doing that. No, I haven't had a chance to, you know, experience your gym yet, but I think that's a beautiful thing that you can do that for people, especially considering that barrier of entry is probably the hardest barrier for someone to overcome. It's difficult for people, especially like in a powerlifting environment. You know, um, people used to walk in or people used to check out the old super training gym and they would, they wouldn't even really walk in. They would sort of like poke their head in because <laughs> we had this like roller door and uh, music blasting and just people lifting crazy amounts of weight, people bleeding, people, you know, head butting the barbell and <laughs> doing all kinds of stuff, <laughs> getting themselves hyped up before they lift. There's chalk and ammonia caps and stuff flying everywhere. Um, a lot of foul language and so forth going on. And so people would just kind of like peer in because they would hear from a friend or hear from somebody that the gym was free and they'd be like, no thanks. <laughs> but they didn't understand that, uh, you know, the people in there, they, they might look intimidating because of their size or, or whatever it might be. But uh, all of us were in there for, this, for a similar goal. We just wanted to be better. We just wanted to get better. And uh, that's all that is required of anybody that steps foot inside of Super Training Gym. You just have to have a goal of wanting to get better. Not necessarily just stronger, not necessarily just more fit, not necessarily, you know, shredded or anything like that, but just be better. Like in whatever your, whatever your goal is, I'd like to help you uh, pursue that. So I think in the mm -hmm. beginning, people had kind of the wrong perception of what was going on. But once people got beyond, you know, being intimidated by how many 300-pound dudes were in this gym and how strong the women were they uh you know would train for a session or two and they would recognize like oh my god like this guy with this goatee and this cut off flannel shirt <laughs> is uh is super nice you know he looks like he's going to a on his way to like a biker rally or something he's got tattoos and um you know not maybe the kind of guy that you wouldn't expect to get into deep conversation with but uh turns out you know, that guy is just like, you know, you, me or anybody else. He's somebody's uh, 
he's somebody's son, he's somebody's friend, he's somebody's dad, whatever the case may be. And he's just in there for the same reason as all of us, and that's to get better. And so uh, it's always been a dream of mine to get around like-minded people. And that's another reason to kind of make that I made the gym free was that I wanted to be around people that had a real desire to be better. But I didn't really care about uh, necessarily, I didn't want it to be cost prohibitive. I just wanted people just the base route, like they just want to get better. And there's plenty of people that it didn't fit. And I had to tell them like, hey, I don't think this really fits you. I don't think this really works out well for you or us. So, you know, you, you can still come if you want, but it doesn't seem like it's working out. And then people from there usually were able to be honest enough with themselves. And they're like, yeah, you're right. I should probably train somewhere else for a while and then come back. Because I, I need you to bring something to the table. You know, you can't just kind of, it's a free gym, but um, there's a cost to everything, right? I need you to bring some sort of energy or bring something to help the other individuals. And it's not just about mm. the strength. Uh, if other people are going to help you and they're going to teach you how to bench, mm-hmm. then you got to support them when they're doing their reps and sets and say, hey, come on, man, you know, get a couple more reps. Just cheer them on, you know, just be encouraging. If you're standing there with your hands in your pockets, you're not really going to be a good teammate. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think the community aspect is super important. Plus, I also think that's just ain't that how we've all met, like our closest boys in the gym. It's like you see him from afar and you're like, God damn, dude, that, that dude looks like a fucking douchebag. Then you go up and meet him, and you're like, damn, this guy's the nicest guy I've ever met. Right, right. Yeah, you see them go deep on a set, and you're like, well, that's the same thing that I do. You know, they're so maybe they dress different than you, look different than you, or whatever it might be. But uh, in the end, you're like, well, the guy just wants to have huge quads like I do. (laughs) You know, the guy (laughs) wants to be stronger like I do. And it's uh, very relatable. You know, that I, or Louis Simmons, (laughs) West Side Barbell. He would say, if you walk with the lame, you'll develop a limp. And so if you are, you know, if you're trying to, if trying to progress, it's kind of hard to be around people that, uh, that don't want to make progress, people that are negative, people that might drag you down. I heard an interesting stat recently where they said that uh, being around positive people and being around people that are like above your pay grade and people uh, that are more successful than you, Uh, can help you to reach some of your goals, but it's more detrimental to be around people. It's exponentially more detrimental to be around people that don't have those desires and they don't, and they're less successful than you. So being around people that are less successful, I'm not saying you got to cut everybody out of your life all the time, but (laughs) being around people that like aren't hungry to be successful and it doesn't seem like they have a good trajectory to go somewhere um, mm-hmm. they're kind of a double negative in a lot of ways. Like not only will they not, uh, help you improve, um, but they could potentially have you going backwards. So uh, you mm-hmm. gotta be really careful of that and cautious of that. Mm-hmm. I, um, I feel that wholeheartedly. I actually moved from San Diego to Los Angeles, uh, January of this year. And I love San Diego. Like the people are there amazing, great energy. There are people there that are out there to, you know, do some work and focus on themselves. But, uh, you know, L.A., you know, everyone here is like work, work, work all the time. Move, right. move, move. And to be honest, even though I was a little bit intimidated by like what the kind of um, environment or I guess energy would be out here. You know, most people tend to be more guarded. I definitely found that like just coming out here and meeting like people just, you know, by chance. These people, I feel like have almost helped me feel elevated in my mm determination and my ability to work just being surrounded by like more like-minded people i'm from upstate new york originally i'm from uh an area called poughkeepsie new york and i went out to visit my brother who was going uh to usc um down in los angeles and when i visited him for maybe just like i don't know it's like a week or so when i went back to new york um you know because where i grew up was more uh rural and it was uh uh, it was like my hometown. So like everyone kind of has like their, everyone kind of hates their hometown in some way, uh, or doesn't appreciate it. And, uh, when I went back, you know, my attitude was just so different, you know, uh, Los Angeles changed me quite a bit, even just from being there just for a week, um, being around people that didn't have ordinary jobs, being around people that were sacrificing a lot, uh, 
you know, my brother's friends, they were like bodybuilders or writers or this or that, but none of them really quite made it yet. And I found that to be really interesting. I was like, that's how the hell are they figuring that out? You know, and then they had, they're a waiter, waitress, whatever job they could figure out to be able to, they're working at a supplement store or something like that, whatever job they could manage or figure out, uh, they had it, you know, just to, just to be able to follow their dream. And I didn't really see that a lot in my own hometown, um, not in the area that I grew up. So I think what, what you said is amazing. Like moving could change your life. You know, it could change your life in a really positive way. Um, and maybe not even necessarily moving right away, just visiting a place first, which is probably what you did from San Diego to L.A. Um, mm -hmm. Visiting a place, getting a feel for it. And then you just start to see like, oh, my God, this area has more people that are like minded to some of the goals that I have. Maybe you go and visit Austin, Texas, and you see how much music is there, or how much comedy is there, or how much. Um, how many podcasters are that, that are there? Like, if you want a podcast, be the best podcaster in the world, you move to Austin, Texas, the way Chris Williamson did from uh, moving from uh, uh, moving from the UK over over to Austin, Texas, and you just put everything on the line. Lex Friedman, a bunch of other guys moved there because Joe Rogan moved there, and then now you see all these comedians and stuff following suit as well. Same mm -hmm. LA has been that way for. I don't know how long with people wanting to be actors, actresses, um, writers, just people that are into art in general. And like, why is that? It's because there's like-minded people there that want to get better and it will help you raise and elevate your game. That's not to say that if you're from the middle of nowhere that you can't make it because you certainly can. And we see that often, but it's just, it might be more difficult. So for me, it was uh, life altering to move to Los Angeles for a while. I started my entire platform in the middle of nowhere. I went to Purdue in uh, Indiana, cornfields. And um, then I moved out to San Diego. And even in San Diego, there were not, there was hardly anyone doing the kind of work that I was doing, trying to put fitness and bodybuilding into social media in San Diego, even though a lot of people are healthy there. So um, tough. a lot of people don't understand what you're doing, right? Like people don't get it. Like, especially when you're in Indiana. Well, oh yeah. They don't. They're like, what are you talking about? Protein bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. People would be looking weird at me for like bringing my uh, protein shakes to class and all this shit. They're like, mm -hmm. dude, <laughs> that's a extra. Are you serious? But um, yeah, no, even at this point, even after growing in a place that was, you know, a little bit more in the middle of nowhere, I still felt ensued to go to L.A. or some other place where I feel like, mm -hmm. right, there's a probably a better environment for growth but um yeah in regards to your gym i thought that was hilarious too because one of my friends actually posted on tiktok that uh he had this idea of like say that you have a gym and you um i don't know like a membership's like a hundred dollars and then every single time that somebody comes in to train like you give them 25 cents back or like 50 cents back <laughs> and the comments like roasted it up they're like that's a stupid idea <laughs> and, i mean i think it's hilarious because i think your gym is like a uh, peak example of like success and building a beautiful community. So, you know, maybe it might work. I don't know. You know, a, a uh, yeah, like an idea where you're paying people to train or exercise. I mean, they try to do that with pro athletes. It doesn't really even work that great. Uh, even with <laughs> professionals, they get paid a couple hundred bucks supposedly to work out and they still don't really want to do it. You know, exercise is something that has to kind of come from your heart. And I think that one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like it that much and why people might need to get paid to go to do it uh, is because, again, I think they just set the bar too high or their idea or, or interpretation of a workout um, is just off. Like, I think that literally just about anything can be a workout. Um, I just went into our gym for maybe five, ten minutes with uh, Andrew, who produces our podcast, and Andrew did some stretches, did some stuff for his lower back. I did some mile fascia release, a couple sets of lap pull downs and just kind of moved around. To me, that's workout number one for the day. That's the way I look at it. So I think people need to probably like if you don't like if you don't like working out, then you need to just maybe stop looking at everything as like this big ass workout. Um, going for a walk can be a form of exercise. Uh, going on a bike ride can be a form of exercise. Um, going on a hike can be a form of exercise, playing tennis or pickleball or volleyball or basketball or 
going outside and throwing a football around with your friend or your or with your son or uh, any of these things, they're all like I think that we should look at those things as not as a put off uh, kind of way, but they should all be looked at as a workout like that should count for you. Like, why isn't that enough to count for you? Like what what is in your brain where you think that everything has to be ah, all out mm-hmm. to I mean, even like online right now, you hear so many bodybuilding people talking about, they're like, I'm high volume, I'm, I'm high volume, I do, I do tons of volume, I do tons of volume. But then they also talk about how they go to failure as well. And you're like, are you fucking crazy? Like, you're doing high volume and you're going to failure on everything. Like, what is going on here? So that is one interpretation of a workout for somebody, but that shouldn't be everybody else's interpretation of a workout. Um I very rarely go that deep into sets like that. Like I'll do that maybe once a month or something like that, twice a month where I go, where I go in so deep on a set where I'm like, I don't even know if that was a good idea, (laughs) (laughs) but it's, uh, it's not the norm, you know? And even back when I was powerlifting and lifting all those, uh, big weights, you know, squatting over a thousand pounds, benching over 800 and so on. I was an equipped power lifter. Um, it was really rare for me to go and hit those max weights. In fact, I never touched those max weights until it was competition time. Uh, I knew, you know, I had a good sense of how they felt because in training I would do certain types of overload techniques and other things to make sure my body wasn't, uh, make sure those weights weren't so foreign to me that I got crushed on the platform. Um, but there's a lot of techniques and a lot of things that you can do to make yourself, um, to, to accommodate your body to get used to some of these uh, big weights. But I think that when people are like, man, yeah, working out's not my game. It's not for me. It's like, well, I would like to, let me take you through a workout. You know, let me, give me a chance. Let me, let me take you through some exercise because I think somebody, I think some idiot somewhere tried to kill you with, you know, you doing uh, lunges, step ups and uh, hack squats until you threw up or something, you know? And yeah, again, that can be a workout. That can be a great workout. That could be awesome. You're 25 years old, you wanna have jacked quads and you've been training for a while, sounds awesome. Uh, But if your first uh, introduction into the weight room is like a negative and you're, you're a smaller framed guy Somebody has you, you know, they're just trying to have you deadlift like 185 and you're shaking all over the place. You kind of hurt your back and your hamstrings feel weird. You're sore for eight days and that's not something that you ended up, like some people love that when that happens. They're like, wow, I really suck at something. This is a cool opportunity for me to get better at it. But a lot of people just feel demoralized. They're like, I'm just going to go back to playing video games because that shit was so uncomfortable. That hurt so bad. And they don't understand, like, you don't have to train that way to get great results. You can go in the gym and do three sets of 10, four sets of 10, accumulate some fatigue by the reps and sets that you do, end up with uh, the last couple reps or the last set or two uh, being things that are just a little strenuous. You can make great progress. You can have a great physique. But I think people are just trying to hammer the shit out of themselves all the time. And then there are also a lot of times people are underfed because people are trying to lose body fat. Yes. They're, they're not getting in the right amount of nutrition. Then they're wondering why they're not motivated. It's like you're not motivated because you don't have any calories in your body. We, we, need, we need some food in our body in order for yeah. you to uh, be able to do some of these crazy workouts that you want to do. But you won't have to worry about the food quite as much if you have more reasonable exercise in your life. I I experienced that myself in the last few years, and I think that's because it's just kind of part of our culture, you know, grind to the end, throw up after your workout, work as hard as possible, be the hardest worker in the room. Except that, of course, if you don't have the knowledge on what your body can actually take, right, then there's actually, I know some people say, oh, you can't overtrain, but for sure, I do believe that there's a concept of overtraining out there. I, I would go to the gym every single, I told, I was talking to Stan Everting about this. Every time I hit leg day, I would go to the gym trying to like PR on eight reps on, on squats as heavy as possible at each time. Cause I hit 405 
for eight. And then I was like, this is awesome. You know, it's something I can brag about. I want more. So I would just keep doing that every single time I do leg day. And every time I do leg day, I'd feel like I would uh, break my back or I'd throw up. And I would do that for years while I was in a deficit because I was trying to stay shredded. And I was wondering why the hell my legs weren't growing. Like maybe I'd gain just a little bit of strength, but like why the hell would my legs not be growing? Well, first off, like I'm training hard, right? But I think the biggest concept here is I'm just not eating enough. Like mm. I think that's the biggest stimulus that people really underlook is like the proper uh, macronutrient and micronutrient profile. Because if you don't, then what the hell is going to be the bricks that are building your muscle? You can do the training stimulus all day, but you need those breaks. Yeah, everything needs ingredients. You know, whatever it is that you're going to do, you want to be stronger. Uh, it's going to need certain ingredients. If you want to be leaner, it needs certain ingredients. Like there's certain fundamental things uh, that you can't really ditch, and you can't just perpetually. It's very difficult to perpetually just lower your calories all the time, and it's very it's even harder to just like lower your calories and move more. Um, the human body is really smart, and when you feed it less, it wants to move less. And then you have people that are also underslept because they're on their phone and stuff like that uh, too much or on their phone in their bed, on their phone late at night. And uh, when you're trying to get leaner, one of the greatest things you can do is just get, get some really good sleep. I know that you must have experienced this a bunch of times, but I know for myself too, um, I've had issues where my weight loss stops. It's not progressing very good. Uh, I start to feel tired, and then just for some reason I just crash, have a great night of sleep, weigh myself the next morning, and boom, there's four pounds gone. And you're like, what the fuck happened there? You just get like this. Your body really needed that rest and sleep, and I'm not saying that you magically burned uh, four pounds of fat in the middle of the night, um, but your body sometimes uh, needs a little reset. And when you give it what it wants, it's able to be more efficient. It's able to get rid of some of the extra water that you might have on your body. And you wake up that day and you're like, man, veins are popping. Like, this is kind of cool. This is awesome. And uh, it's really important that you have, you have to supply yourself with, there has to be some form of energy, whether it's coming from your rest, uh, your rest and recovery methods, or if it's coming from your food. Um, now, at the same time, you know, you can't lie to yourself and be like, man, I'm getting strong, so I'm, I need to eat an extra 2,000 calories. Like, that's, that's overkill, and you're just going to end up being a fat power lifter. You don't really need to go mm -hmm. to that extreme. Uh, but, you know, you might need to just, like a lot of people like to snack, you know. People like to snack, and what I would say about snacking, especially like if there's not really protein in it, Snacking is kind of a waste of time. It can be somewhat beneficial just to like the brain, just because it feels good. It's kind of fun to do, but it's a waste of it's a waste of time if you're trying to really improve yourself, because it's taking up space for otherwise more valuable nutrients. Uh, if you know, if you had breakfast and you had a couple eggs or whatever the style of diet you're on, you had some egg whites and some rice or whatever it is, um, and then a few hours later you decide to have um, you decide to have a snack, you have, uh, you know, a couple granola bars and like a little thing of milk or something like that. That could be like filling. That is energy. Like that's, there's nothing wrong with that energy. There's nothing wrong with those foods are not necessarily bad. But now when you go to eat your next thing, you're not as hungry as you should be for it. And then you eat half of that meal and so on and so forth. And you rob yourself of the nutrients that you actually need, or even better examples, sometimes people kind of eat like a light breakfast and then they go and get some monster burrito from like Chipotle. And that takes hours. That takes hours and hours to digest. That's why Stan Efferding created the vertical diet because he wants you to stack foods that are a little lighter, basically uh, foods that you can go from one meal to the next meal to the next meal and continue to eat three, four, five, six meals a day on his plan. I'm not even saying that's how many times you have to eat in a day, but that's sort of the way his plan works. But I think you see this a lot where people are like not eating that much because they don't want to be fat and then they're binging and they go back and forth and back and forth. And I think one of the most powerful things people could do is supply themselves with the nutrients they need, make sure they get enough sleep and just avoid binging on shitty foods. Like for most people, for most men, 
if they could figure that out and let's just face the facts like it's sometime after like 7 or 8 p.m at night like if you could if you could cut out that habit of what you eat past eight o'clock because it's probably nothing good um you're gonna be on your way to probably getting pretty lean so you've created yourself honestly quite an empire especially just from starting off as like a power lifter and an athlete what is your earliest memory that defined you to become this you know accomplished athlete podcaster entrepreneur that you are today I would have to say like you know it's it's hard to say like what the real earliest memory is it's almost easier to look back on it and kind of make it up <laughs> um <laughs> but uh you know I grew up I grew up with two amazing parents and my parents both instilled in me um that I could kind of be whatever I want and they also encouraged me and gave me the idea of like it's totally fine to like try something and not do great at it and then try something else. Um, so, you know, I, I played football. I did a lot of other sports and a lot of other things. and I did okay with those things, but just like a lot of other kids, I wanted to be like a pro football player and things like that. But as certain things didn't work out, it was never like, oh, that didn't work out. You know, you're a loser and you're just going to like sit around and do nothing. It was like, no, let's try to find the next thing to attack. Let's try to find the next thing to go to. Powerlifting has kind of always been around for me. I started lifting when I was really young. I was around 12, and I think I competed in my first powerlifting meet at like 13 or 14 years old. Um, oh, my gosh. They, they had the gym that I went to. Uh, a bunch of guys there were into powerlifting. And uh, back then um, in the area that I grew up, the dudes in the gym were big. Like everybody was big and everybody was into strength. Not everybody was a competitive powerlifter necessarily, um, but a lot of guys looked like off-season bodybuilders. They were just huge. And so powerlifting and, like, kind of being big and strong was a thing that was kind of always circulating in the background. And it was something that I kept returning to over and over again when I tried to do other stuff and didn't have the success I was looking for. Um, I did professional wrestling and a bunch of other stuff, and those things didn't quite work out the same way as uh, lifting did. I kind of from the time I was very young and I lifted uh, with my friends and stuff, I was always a little stronger. I was a little bigger. And so it just, it really, it really uh, suited me really well. Uh, but the idea of like combining some stuff together and, uh, you know, having uh, business be something that I wanted to succeed in as well as weights is something that came from, again, my upbringing, uh, my house, my dad, uh, on the East Coast, you have like a basement, not just like a garage, you have a basement. And uh, the basement's not like where you park you park your car or anything like that. Usually it's uh, it's more like a storage area. But my dad converted uh, our basement into an office for his tax practice. And the other side of it was a weight room. So business and weights went together from, the, you know, the, some of my earliest memories of being 10, 12 years old. Um, you know, I'd work out and uh, crank the music in there, and then my dad would say, "Hey, you know, I got a client over here. You got to, you know, turn turn down the Twisted Sister or Metallica or whatever it was I was cranking ACDC. Um, and uh, so that I kind of saw that from an early age, and I remember getting done with workouts and then uh, just going over to the other side because uh, my dad kind of had this like just partitioning wall, and I'd go over to the other side and I would talk to him and. I would kind of tell him what I did. I did bench and curls, and my dad doesn't lift, so he didn't know what I was talking about. But then he would tell me what he did, and I wouldn't know what he was talking about because he was doing, like, taxes. But I did realize that he was making money, and he'd be like, oh, here's a check from your Uncle Tom. Here's a check from your aunt. Here's a check from, you know, our pastor. Here's, And I'm like, you make money off all your friends and family? <laughs> I'm like, this is weird. And he's like, well... He's like, they won't let me do it for free. He's like, I, I offered to do it for free before, and if they're ever in financial trouble and they need help, I would love to do it for free. But he's like, this is my business, so they respect that and they pay me. And I always thought that was awesome. I'm like, that's really cool uh, that they pay you. So I saw that kind of stuff from an early age, and my dad explained a lot of stuff to me uh, when I was young that I think um, later had me kind of – it just was always in, in my head. My uh, grandfather was an entrepreneur as well. He he was uh, like a used car salesman, but 
he also was uh he was like pretty crafty he he would make shirts uh that had the name of his uh uh, Sheldon Bell, his name was it said Sheldon Bell Auto, and he had like shirts, and he'd give people free pens, and I mean just doing stuff like I don't know, seventy years ago, eighty years ago that uh, people do now, people do today. You know, they they try to make try to raise brand awareness. What do you do? You make a T-shirt, right? And so, uh, kind of without even really thinking about it, when I was young, as I got older, I was like, oh, like that shit's always been promotion. And uh, uh, hustling your own business has always kind of been in the background because my dad did it. My dad had to do it because he lost his job with IBM and he just course corrected by uh, by starting his own tax practice. So I've been around that stuff since I was young. And so it's just uh, probably uh, ingrained into my head somewhere. What through your career has like made you anxious since this point? Um, I- I'm pretty good at, uh, at, at handling uh, situations. So... Uh, I'm not an anxious person. I don't have anxiety. I don't have depression. I don't have, uh, I don't really worry. I, I've found that like it's, <laughs> I found it to not be super helpful. Um, I'll have concerns here and there. I'll be worried about something here and there, but uh, it's pretty rare. I, again, I think if, if I go back to my childhood and um, growing up with two older brothers and uh having some awesome parents i i grew up over a period of time gaining more and more confidence in myself and i think i was the youngest of my of our family and uh you know i got picked on a lot and a lot of that kind of stuff but i think that helped with my maturity and uh through that process it just helped a ton with my confidence and i you know would I would try a sport or would try something and it wouldn't be too long until I got better at it or I started to make some really good progress at it or um, I got admiration, you know, by teammates, friends, coaches, and so forth. And that really uh, that really built up a lot of confidence in me. And I, I was reading a book recently. It's called uh, The Molecule of More and it's about dopamine. And as I was reading that book, I'm like, oh, my God, so much of this makes sense. When you earn your dopamine, you gain tremendous amounts of confidence in yourself or not even necessarily when you earn it. That's actually the problem with drugs is that they just give you dopamine. It's like, here you go. Here's dopamine. So you get that through amphetamines, cocaine, Adderall, things like that. That's why they make people feel so awesome. Um, But I was getting dosages of that through, uh, you know, my parents being supportive, my brothers being supportive. My brothers are also dickheads, too, because they're older brothers. It's kind of their job. Uh, but, um, I was gaining a lot of that dopamine through doing better in track, through doing better in football, through, uh, some improvements where I had some struggles was in the classroom, was in school. And that is something that, again, I had other talents and other skills that I could lean on and not really worry so much about school. Um, but when I was younger, that was something that I was worried and concerned about because, I was like, well, it seems like, you know, I'm 46 years old. So at the time, it seemed like everybody like just went to like high school and then they went to college and they got a job. And uh, I didn't hear a ton about like entrepreneurship, but I didn't even really realize that my dad and my grandfather at the time were uh, entrepreneurs because I just, I don't know, I just didn't, I didn't uh, recognize it. Entrepreneur when I was a kid just meant you didn't have a job basically. (laughs) It meant you were unemployed. (laughs) And so, um, you know, as I got older, I had to kind of grow out of some of that and had to just understand, like, you got your own set of talents, you got your own set of skills. Um, Just completely fuck what you don't know. Don't worry about that. Just focus in on what you're good at. Focus in on, uh, on what you like. And so I just leaned into that more and more and more. And it became more and more obvious and more apparent that I was going to be a power lifter. And so when you do something like squat 900 pounds, it's kind of hard for, it's kind of hard for you to think that you're not going to succeed in other areas. It's like, I just fucking took 900 pounds on my back and squatted it. Like, what else can I do? You know? And then the same thing happened in the bench and the same thing started happening and happening in a deadlift. Um, and then when I would go to competitions, I was able to go against other people and beat them. And that just, it just started to, 
roll over on itself to a point where um, when I put out products, when I started putting out products in 2010, uh, the creation of the Slingshot and the creation of a lot of the products that are within the Slingshot brand, I just thought I was awesome. I thought I was cool. So I was like, I'm just going to put these out and people are going to like them. Like, you're going to like this. Like, I know you're going to dig it. There was zero question about it. There was zero question. And the sport that I'm in is fucking cool. You're going to dig that too. And I, it it seemed like it worked out pretty good. And it seemed like it worked out well in terms of powerlifting because I felt that powerlifting was like underserved. Like people didn't know about powerlifting. And my YouTube channel started in 2006. Before that, I was shooting videos on something called Put File, which doesn't even exist anymore in 2004 and 2005. And I was on forums and threads filming stuff since 2003 or so or 2002. Um, and I think all that ended up being uh, a big time uh, support of what I was working on the whole time, which I didn't even really know what it was I was working on. All I was trying to do is show people that powerlifting is awesome. And when I look back on some stuff now, I can recognize it better and I could say, okay, well, all you really ever been trying to do is sell people some ideas, some concepts. And uh, that's still what I do. So sometimes people look at my social media and they'll see me selling like a gadget or selling like a thing and they get pissed. And I'm like, I've been selling stuff to you the entire time you've known me the whole time. I've sold you on powerlifting. I sold you on keto diets. I sold you on carnivore diet. I sold you on the meat and fruit diet. I sold you on this. I sold you on that. I've been selling you on stuff the entire time because that's what I do. I, I, I like to find and discover things. And then when I find and discover things and I think they're useful, I want to promote them. I want to share them with you. So there's not always a, a monetary uh, exchange. I'm not always literally trying to hawk something to you, trying to make money off of it. Uh, I'm trying to open your eyes and expand you, expand your mind into some things that I think that you're going to find interesting or some things that I think you're going to find as being cool. Speaking of all your diets, so as you lived as a wrestler, powerlifter, bodybuilder, and you're doing running now too, right? Yes. Yep. Running, podcaster and company owner, how did your diet change throughout that and what did you learn? Diet wise, you know, I've been kind of hovering around a very similar diet for a pretty long time. I would say the major change over the last couple of years is just to not eat as much fat. Um, I would, I was always been a big fan of like a low carb or lowish carb style of diet, but you know, nowadays, you know, it's not uncommon for me to eat 200 grams of carbs or something in a day, or maybe even 300, but you know, I'm still 220 pounds, pretty lean. So it's, it's, uh, there's some days where I don't eat hardly any carbohydrates just cause I don't really think about them that much. Uh, fruit, rice, potato, it's pretty much what I try to stick to. Um, ultimately, I would say probably the most valuable thing I've learned in the last couple of years uh, is the, there's a, there are a couple things, but one thing more recently is just having some carbohydrates in, like even the smallest amount of carbohydrates, 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrates can help you get from one workout to another workout. We were talking earlier about having the right ingredients just a small, just a, a small thing of food, 15 grams of protein, you know, some fruit and some yogurt or something like that, 20 minutes before uh, a workout, like after I ran for a little while, sometimes something like that can really give me a nice boost during the workout along with just having like essential amino acids, which I think is just almost more so for like the hydration of drinking the liquid than anything else, but uh, things like that have been really profound, but the biggest discovery I've had is the idea of protein leveraging and the idea that, in my opinion, protein doesn't really count much, uh, especially lean sources of protein. Uh, protein has uh, four calories per unit, but uh, per gram, but in my opinion, I think that number is, is off, and I think the way that calories are measured are way off. And I've, I've thought that from the beginning. I've been talking about this forever. And I don't know if anything will ever change, um, but ca counting calories can be useful because it can be, it's a useful endeavor to examine the foods that are going into your body. Um, however, the foods that people are usually trying to calculate that go into their body are usually pretty healthy for them. I know occasionally people are tracking 
uh, things for like if it fits your macros and some things like that. But uh, to me, the idea of protein leveraging and protein being king uh, is has been massively beneficial because what I've noticed was is that I can eat a lot of protein. I could eat three, 400 grams of protein and have it have zero negative impact on me being able to control and manage my body weight. Um, I didn't, I didn't really know that before. I didn't understand. I didn't have a good understanding of that. And it's something I try to share with people quite often, but I think that people still don't really believe me, but it's something that you can try. One of the problems with, yeah, one of the problems with increasing your protein, uh, like a madman, uh, can be that it's going to accompany other calories. So that's always something you have to keep in mind. If you're like, oh, I upped my protein, like Mark said, and I gained body fat. In my opinion, the only way that that's even humanly possible uh, is if you're, that's accompanied by other calories. Um, but if you think about protein in general, the way that you would get protein in nature, protein would, would be accompanied by fat. You know? um, but you know, we, we know how to deconstruct uh, a chicken to where we have skinless, boneless chicken breasts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there's... There's advantages. There's chicken breast. There is egg whites. There's protein powders. Pro- the powders aren't going to work the same, really. You kind of almost need the leaner foods. Um, but uh, I've been working with a company for a few years now called Certified Piedmont- Piedmontese. And the beef that they have, the cattle that they have, the way that they are, um, the way that they're raised, they're just super lean. They're super lean and super jacked. And so the, uh, most of their steaks and stuff like that have half the amount of fat uh, that a regular steak would have. So things like that have been really uh, transformative to me because in a given day I could eat like two or three pounds of meat, which is a pretty good, a pretty good serving of food. Uh, I've also found that like blueberries and just kind of berries in general or maybe even almost fruit in general seems to also be a little bit of a freebie. Now, they, fruit is accompanied by energy. There is sugar in fruit. Uh, but something like blueberries has so many other things going on. There's other cofactors in the blueberries that help uh, help regulate the uh, blood sugar. And there's also um, a lot of fiber in those blueberries. And so you can kind of have at it, in, in my opinion, with large amounts of protein. If you're a 200-pound, uh, large amounts of protein and large amounts of blueberries, if you're a 200-pound person listening to this right now, um, if you were to eat somewhere between 200 and 300 grams of protein per day, uh, along with maybe like two servings of fruit, two servings of vegetables every single day, and those servings you can kind of, you know, you can just self-regulate on that. I mean, are you going to eat like 10 apples, you know, or wow, what are you going to, what are you going to do from like a food, food perspective, you know? So you could go vegetables, fruit, um, and 200 to 300 grams of protein. And then, uh, and then from an energy perspective, like if you feel like you need more because you're lifting and running and stuff, then you can say, all right, well, I'll throw in like a cup of rice or I'll have like a potato or two. But I think that just about anybody listening to this right now will get shredded based off of that information. Uh, you might have to, you know, move things around a little bit, maybe keep the fat calories or keep the fat grams like under 100 or maybe even under 80, depending on the person, depending on your size. Uh, and I think that would be... a uh, really reasonable start has this been the kind of diet that you've attacked throughout like your change as like an athlete like because you started with wrestling and powerlifting right and then now you're focusing on running now has this diet been the same throughout that i've just done so many different diets you know to start losing weight from powerlifting you know I, i was 330 pounds nowadays i'm 220 But when I was 330, the first diet that I started was the paleo diet. I started like the paleo solution, which is basically kind of almost like the vertical diet, you know, just the meat, fruit, vegetables, avoiding certain types of uh, things that might be inflammatory to your body and to your gut and stuff like that. Um, From there, I started going a little bit more like into keto and uh, eating a lot less carbohydrate upping the fats, upping the protein. And that was really useful and helpful to me because I was addicted to food because my diet before all that, before I started my weight loss journey, when I was powerlifting, uh, was, uh, 
you know, when I was powerlifting, I was just eating like pretty healthy throughout the day and then just eating like ice cream, pizza, eating a lot of stuff to just keep the calories really high. And uh, mm -hmm. at that time, at that time, I had some pretty good knowledge on diet and stuff, but it, it got to a point where I got to like 270 or so or two, two, yeah, around 270. And I just, it was very difficult to gain any more weight. And I was like, I think I need to like throw in some like junk food into this mixture. And so I started doing that, but that, that whole thing got out of control. And when I got to be 300 plus pounds, I was now addicted to the taste of, you know, ice cream and pizza and some of these other things. And so that's why I chose the paleo diet at first. I was like, okay, I still get to have some fruit. I still get to have some like almond butter and shit like that and and some honey and stuff and so i don't think it's going to be that bad so i did that paleo solution from rob wolf lost about 40 pounds 50 pounds and then uh went on more of a keto diet because still what was happening occasionally on the paleo diet was i would still um have these cravings and i would still cheat on my diet and then i was like i threw in keto and cut the carbs down even more and having that break from the carbohydrates and having that be a definitive line of like, you can do this and you can't do that. For me at that time, it was really helpful. So that helped bring my body weight down another like 30, 40 pounds. And then once I was tamed and once I was like not so, uh, not so attached to some of those foods, I could then start to bring carbohydrates back in. Um, but I had to kind of do so carefully because a weird thing is, is even when I would bring potatoes in or rice somewhere in my head was like that power lifter mentality of like, you're lifting big still and you got to be big. And so once I would eat some of that stuff, it would kind of, uh, make me just think it was okay to still eat a bunch of junk food. And so I would kind of fall off the rails with that. Mm. Now where I'm at is a really wonderful place. And it's probably similar to a spot that you're in. I wouldn't even really call what I do anymore a diet. Like it's not in any sort of category and people sometimes get frustrated with that because they're like, are you still carnivore? Are you still, cause I've done the carnivore diet. I really love the carnivore diet, but, uh, the majority of my food and the majority of, of, uh, of what I eat is animal based, but I still eat some fruit. I still eat some vegetables. Um, I'm going to have a glass of wine with my wife. I'm going to, if my daughter makes some cookies or something, I might eat a couple cookies. If she makes some brownies, I might eat some brownies. Um, but when I say some, like I'm talking about like eating two or three, whereas before I didn't have that same control. Um, and then also too, like just the small things over time, like just recognizing like I don't need, I love to eat. I love to really fill myself up with food, but I've also just kind of learned over time, like, man, you don't need that much. Like you literally don't need that much. You don't need, okay, I, I am running six miles a day or 10 miles in a given day and lifting weights and stuff. So again, back to the ingredients, we do need ingredients for success. We need calories for success here, but um, you're also not running a hundred miles in a day. So, uh, you know, fuel yourself appropriately and try to be reasonable and rational with it. So paleo, keto, carnivore, carb, well-balanced, which one would you say was the best performance for you? I think, I think now I think, uh, like what I'm doing right now is the best. And right now what I'm doing is what I would like to teach to a lot of people that don't feel like they're necessarily really addicted to food. Um, there are people that are heavier. There are people that are obese that like in my opinion, those people need to like draw a hard line in the sand and they need to have very black and white rules. But I do think that for other people, if you start out with natural foods, you start out eating, um, you know, meat, rice, potatoes, fruit, vegetables, things like that, and maybe a little bit of dairy that you really can't go wrong. Like, I don't, I don't think, I guess you can kind of take it as a challenge, but I guess you could get fat off of those foods if you figured out a way to really combine them. Um, if you start mixing a lot of fat and carbohydrates together, that gets you into a situation where it's really easy to overeat. Um, but, you know, so many things just come down to the simple idea of how do you halt yourself from overeating 
And how do you still supply yourself with the right amount of macronutrients and micronutrients every single day? Those cups need to be filled up every day. Otherwise, your performance isn't going to be good. A really interesting thing with running is that if you, if you run and you run in an aerobic state, you're basically burning a lot of fat. Uh, if you run and you're doing like nasal breathing and your heart rate is um, in this like zone two cardio area, um, which is like, for me, is like between like 130 and 140. If your heart rate's real modest, you're in this like zone two cardio zone, you're burning fat. If you start to push beyond that, you start to get into your heart rate goes to 150 and 160 and stuff. You start to get in like a glycolytic state where you start to burn, you're starting to burn uh, carbohydrates, start to burn glucose, burn sugar. But like, so somebody might look at that in a ma under a magnifying glass and be like, I want the fat burning workout. Well, do you think you burn fat when you sprint? <laughs> like, fuck yeah, you burn tons of fat when you sprint. But you not, might not burn a lot of fat in the actual sprint itself. So I think the science that we try to have around nutrition, I think is fucked in a lot of ways because it, it holds a magnifying glass or puts a flashlight on like this one particular thing. And you're like, that's where people hone in on. That's what people sometimes focus in on. And it's, it's, uh, it's not the right way to do it because when you sprint, maybe you didn't burn a lot of fat technically while you were sprinting. But what about the after effects? What about the, what about the aftermath of that? Or people tend to look at like, um, remember people were talking about glycemic index and it's like that never held up because people eat different foods at different times. People probably still don't know this, but there's something called the, the second effect of, uh, of meals. So if you have, if you have protein like an hour or two before a meal or an hour or two before you were to eat something, that's going to impact the glucose. That's going to impact the sugar uh, in your body. That's going to impact the way that your body reacts to the carbohydrates that are in that next meal because the first meal uh, had protein in it. So there's a lot of things. There's so many variables like, okay, what if you just got done with a workout? You just got done with lifting. You had a great workout and you had your uh, post-workout shake with some carbs and some protein in it. Um, well, what's that next meal look like now? Like, how does your body respond to it? We don't even really know. So it's so much of, of the science I think has uh, been helpful in some ways, but I also think it's been, it's been hurtful in, in trying to think that um, we can really science the body. I don't think that you really can. I think that you have to go more by how you feel, how you look, your weight on the scale, measurements. Even even body fat tests can be way the hell off. So uh, it's it's hard to, you know, it's it's. I think it's easier to try to look at yourself and to try to have a coach than it is to uh, try to look at some some of these studies and have them be like really helpful in uh, in helping us determine. Again, the same thing happens with workouts. You know, P go to failure, volume. Like it's. What if you do both? What if, uh, what if you do more volume for your legs and you do more going to failure for your upper body? Or what if you do the reverse of that? Or what, what it was your, what were the last, uh, three months of your workouts like, you know, and, and what about, uh, the last three weeks of your diet? Like does the last three weeks of your diet, does that determine how you're going to burn calories today? Fuck yeah, it does. But no one has, they don't have like information on that. We don't have good information on that. No one really talks about mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. I believe it was a journey in Shaspe, maybe, that said uh, order of what you consume in each meal, right? Vegetables first, protein and fats, and then followed by carbohydrates will help blunt mm -hmm. the uh, blood sugar spike. Right. And I've always added in uh, Stan Efferding's famous 10-minute walk afterwards, and that's mm -hmm. phenomenal, man. I feel so Works much great. better after that. Instead of having and that's to pass a great right example. A big ass meal. That's such a good example of like some low hanging fruit, like a walk after your meal sounds like a a really reasonable idea. So is this uh was the well balanced also, would you say, the best diet for you for overall health and happiness? I think so, because it keeps me from keeps me from really having like cravings. You know, when I when I can have it probably sounds funny to some people listening that maybe haven't gotten past certain levels of dieting but um if i can have an orange or i can have 
blueberries or raspberries or there's just like there's so much flavor to a lot of these things. Uh, it really prevents me from going off the deep end. And then also the other thing I've done is like just a simple like eat this, not that sort of thing where I have Quest bars, legendary foods like the legendary tasty pastries, those pop tart things, the legendary uh, the sticky bun type of thing that they have. So I'll have like little treats like that here and there, but that's usually, you know, at, when I'm done uh, eating dinner and I get like a little craving for something. Now I have something that has, you know, 200 calories, but it also has 20 grams of protein in it. So I think that people, uh, it's hard to make those changes and those switches, but I think people can do them. And for me, the other thing that I wanted to mention, you're mentioning performance. I think that that's the part that gets uh, missed is that if your diet's not serving your performance, then you're missing out. Because my example uh, earlier about running, oh, oh, am I still there? Oh, yeah. Yep. Disappeared for like 30 seconds. Okay, disappeared for a minute. What I was going to mention is uh, about performance. And, um, you know, you could set yourself up to go on a run and you could be fasted. And that run could be with the idea that you're going to burn fat. Okay, you're going to burn fat, but how is your run going to actually go? You might be able to put less energy into it. Uh, same thing with a workout. You might be able to put less energy into the workout if you don't have a, uh, a pre-workout meal. Uh, you don't have any, again, you don't have the right ingredients. But if you have a pre-workout meal or you have a pre-workout uh, meal before you go and run, you're going to be able to run harder most likely. You'll be able to run faster if you have the right hydration, if you have the right uh, foods in you. So you're going to burn more calories in that performance. Or you're going to be able to lift a little bit more weight. What's it do for you when you lift a little bit more weight? Uh, what's the outcome when you're able to do uh, 12 sets for your chest as opposed to uh, only four or five with a decent intensity? It's going to have a greater impact. So I think each person has to kind of look at it from a perspective of, uh, you know, how am I going to nourish my body the best? for my best performance. We'll get right back to the podcast in a second, but I just wanted to take this break to thank you guys immensely because this podcast is my favorite content to create and I couldn't have done it without you guys. Contributing to it will further help its growth and allow us to listen to more amazing guests such as the one you're listening to today. So if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by rating us at five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you find your podcast or subscribing to the YouTube channel. And if you would like to help fund the podcast, you can do so by using Nile for a discount off of Young LA clothing or huge supplements. Thank you guys again so much. We'll be right back to the podcast. Yeah, I was mentioning in terms of performance, you know, I think that it's uh, it's undervalued. You know, if you have a proper meal before you go and run or before you go and lift, your output is going to be greater. Your exercise is going to be greater. So while you might be able to look at something under a microscope or look at something in a study and say, oh, if I go for a run fasted, I'm going to like, quote unquote, burn more fat. That might be true, but you also might burn four or 500 more calories by running with some fuel in your body because you'll ha have a better performance. And then also I think it would, it would be a value to just kind of consider what is the training session that you're about to go do? Like let's say that your chest is a weak point. Well, maybe you know that workout isn't the workout that you're trying to – you know, worry about like being skinny. You're not worried about like burning fat. You're going into that workout to try to actually grow your chest or to be stronger. Have a meal that will serve you, that will allow you, that will give you the ingredients, the foundation that you need um, to go and do that. And so I think that um, people need to kind of evaluate what style of nutrition is going to really be helpful for that. And I think this is actually where some processed foods can come into play. Uh, it's very common for bodybuilders to have a little bit of cereal or something like that before a workout or like a Rice Krispie treat or um, a lot of the, a lot of that area is where a snack could be something that could be beneficial because now you have 100, 200, 300 calories of a snack, maybe with like a protein shake or something like that. You have that before your workout, you get a little bit better pump for the day. And also what's going to happen too, like if you, if you're able to lift a little heavier, you're able to use the 30 pound dumbbells instead of the 25 and so on. So I think it's important that we really try to, uh, fuel our workouts, but also 
at the same time, be reasonable. You know, when you're like uh, when you're home at home for dinner and you, you know, lifted that day and maybe you went to jujitsu or you ran, you did something else. You don't it might feel like you need 20,000 calories, but you don't you you uh, you need to just try to in that moment be reasonable and uh, select foods that will uh, kind of fill in some of the nutrients that you may have lost from the day. So if you only had three descriptive things to tell someone to help them become the strongest person alive, what would they be? To be the strongest person alive. Three descriptive things. Well, uh, man, that is a tough one to knock down because my interpretation of strength has changed so much over the years where it's not even, you know, it's not limited to the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say you need like an input of ma- a max you need an input of some sort of maximum, you know, uh, whether that is like lifting of a weight, like a deadlift, or that is going outside and doing a sprint. Um, you need to be able to put your body into some sort of, um, maximum intensity could be swimming in a pool, could be anything. So that will help with, uh, improvements in strength. So you need it. You need an input need some sort of input to be strong. Um, Then you're going to need something to recover from that. Uh, That could be, uh, you know, a handful of days off. That could be sleep. And then the third thing, of course, is steroids. (laughs) Food. You need food. You need food. So you need need an input from training that's going to tell your body, that's going to share with your body the message of getting stronger. You need some sleep and you need some food. Uh, you could look at any study that you want, but anytime somebody has gained hypertrophy, anytime that someone's gained strength, um, anytime that someone's really gained anything, they're they're almost always in like a maintenance calorie or or they have a, a caloric surplus. And as you were mentioning, you were saying you're trying to get stronger while being a caloric deficit. Um, it's hard to be in a deficit when it's something that you're working towards takes extra energy. Um, I suppose it's possible, but I would say that uh, it's probably more possible by an inaccurate calculation than it is like actually a probable thing. Even if you're trying to improve yourself on just like the amount of reps you can do for a pull-up or you're trying to improve yourself on um, uh, the, the, the size of your back, like if you're trying to get your back bigger, I think that you need to uh, be in a little bit of a caloric surplus. You need to eat a little bit more food. Mm-hmm. In the case of the pull-up, it's actually not really the, necessarily the best example because sometimes losing weight will help as well because mm-hmm. you have something uh, you know that's referred to as your relative strength, which is your strength-to-weight ratio, mm-hmm. which is, in my opinion, in my opinion, your strength-to-weight ratio should be the top of the food chain for strength. Like that can change over the years mm-hmm. uh, in accordance to your goals, but you should be able to jump. You should be able to sprint. If you're listening to this and you haven't sprinted in a long time. I would say work the next couple months or even years on figuring out ways to get yourself to be able to sprint um, because a lot of people lose that capacity and it's just, it's a foolish thing to lose. We were able to do it when we were young. You could sprint anywhere, anytime, but uh, we think that it has to do with age and it doesn't have to do with age. It has to do with input. You don't, you haven't had that input in a long time. So don't just go out to a track and sprint because I'm talking about sprints because you'll get hurt. But maybe uh, sprint on an elliptical or sprint on a uh, airdyne bike. Um, find different ways to put in good, strong efforts for 10 seconds at a time, 15 seconds at a time, 20 seconds at a time, things like that. And then hopefully over time you can actually get yourself out on a track and maybe and maybe run a little bit. A hill is really good. You can most people can like sprint a hill because you can. Uh, you're just you're mo- you're moving a lot slower, so it's a lot safer. But anything that's new, you always want to be really, really cautious with and take your time. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure I remember oh, what was it? I think Andrew Huberman was talking about how it's a how it's still really important to do a zone five phase of cardio at least once a week. And then mm. Peter Tia, I believe, was probably re- referring referencing that zone five is probably one of the most effective ways you can increase your VO2 max, which is one of the uh, leading factors for longevity. 
So something that I was taking to note because I never sprint. So <laughs> I've been implementing that recently mm-hmm. in the last few months too. It could be fun. You know, it's fun to mix up different stuff. You know, mm-hmm. uh, a really simple VO2 max style workout, you know, could be that you go pretty hard on the Aerodyne bike for three to four minutes. And then you take an equivalent amount of rest, three to four minutes. And you do that three to four times. And that's like, you know, take you 20 something minutes to get that workout done. Um, that's going to be tremendously powerful for your heart. It's also going to help with nutrient partitioning. It's going to help shuttle nutrients and carbohydrates, uh, glucose and so forth into mainly your legs at that point, because that's going to be the most exhausted. But aerodyne bike, you kind of get the upper body uh, in there too. But I found that to be super beneficial as well. Like um, these kind of workouts that are really just your workout. It's just so silly. I, I you know, I, I've always felt this way, but your workouts don't have to kill you. Your workouts can, they can have, they can have so many different purposes. You know, you can go in there and do your drop sets and do all these things, but you can also just go in there and literally just say, I want to have some uh, nutrients and some blood flow go to my arms. And by doing so, and by doing that occasionally, um, your arms are actually going to grow from that. It's enough of a stimulus. It doesn't always have to be uh, this like devastating stimulus to try to have the muscles just get bigger. Sometimes the muscles will get bigger because uh, they're able to uptake, uh, they're able to uptake the nutrients that are in your body a little easier. Uh, the salt that's in your body, the glucose that's in your body, it'll literally be sitting in your arms when you get done with the arm workout and you just ate some carbohydrates. So your workouts don't always have to be these things where you just completely blitz and annihilate the area. I think it's so hard though. A lot of us always want to be the best at everything. You know, everyone wants to be big and everyone wants to be strong. I think sometimes we just have to choose, you know, sometimes you just have to focus on one thing because unless you're like... I don't know, Ronnie Coleman or Larry Wheels, it's really, really hard to do that without breaking yourself. Yeah, I've always, I I usually try to tell people, <laughs> it's not so nice, but I usually try to tell people you suck anyway, so what's the difference? You know, like you're, you're, you only got 275 on the squat bar. You know, I'm not trying to make fun of your, where you're at and stuff like that, but literally just cool it, man. Like fucking squat 185 and learn how to do it the right way mm. before you go and try to, you know, uh, just totally annihilate yourself with, with, uh, a 275 squat when it's just not appropriate weight for you at the moment. Mm -hmm. Like you're not that good at it anyway. So if you're not that strong already, why not work on the technique? Like let's, let's have you work on something different. You know, like for me with running, I'm not a great runner yet, but what can I do? You know, what, what can I work on uh, when I'm running? And I think about that. I'm like, what can I do that uh, maybe other runners, other runners can't do? And the only answer I have so far is smile. So when I'm running, you're going to see me with a big ass smile on my face because I'm not good at anything else yet. But I'm trying to learn the technique. I'm taking my time with it. This thing's, they all, everything takes time. And uh, again, it's not to try to make fun of anybody or, or, or say, fuck, man, you're weak and laugh at anybody because I like meeting people where they're at. But at the same time, if you're new to this, you have to settle into that. You have to be a white belt and you have to get shit on and you have to suck for a while. And it's okay to suck. It's great to suck. It's you're in the perfect spot because you have so much room for growth, but just take your time with it. Learn how to do it the right way. Absolutely agree. So what are your thoughts on uh, steroids and the PEDs in the industry? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. You know, it's, it's really, it's really exploded, you know, because you can get, you know, people can get stuff from like, uh, you know, from a pharmacy, they can go to, you know, these TRT clinics and so forth and, and get stuff. And I think at first it started for guys that were like in their 40s. And then, you know, now you see it trickle down into guys that are in their 30s. And now you see it trickle down even lower. Um, I think, you know, uh, from a perspective of like TRT and people using like therapeutic dosages, I think that people don't really understand. I think that people just think steroids are steroids. But when someone's on a legit therapeutic uh, amount, it doesn't really do a ton for you. You know, and it, it's it's sometimes not even worth explaining to people like, oh, yeah, sure, it doesn't do that much for you. But right, like right now, I'm 220 pounds. When I was in high school, I was 240 pounds. Um, and I wasn't on anything. It didn't take anything until I was 25 years old. 
And so I think that people just think like you just take steroids and you just get fucking jacked and so strong and it's like unbelievable. That's not that's not completely true. Uh, you can go in the gym and, and train and you can get away with training a little less. You can get away with uh, being a little less strict on your diet, especially if you're blasting steroids, like if you're abusing steroids. Um, you can certainly get away with some of that. But the negatives aside, I think that I think steroids are really interesting. And to me, it's it's unfortunate they've exploded like exploded in the way that they have because I think some people that probably weren't ready for them and probably uh, shouldn't take them have taken them. They're a big responsibility. Uh, they can they can mess up your hormones. Um, and for young for young men, like it's it it could it could really wreak havoc a lot. I think that uh, it can increase your like when you're a young man. Like I don't you know I don't know where you're at with this, but when I was a young man, like I did not need any help increasing my libido. That actually would have been like more to my detriment. Like I didn't need to be any fucking hornier than I already was. Thanks. And then uh, the other thing is is that I don't know if young people understand or if people understand in general that uh, abuse of steroids or even just steroids on the wrong person can actually uh, can actually negatively impact, can have a negative impact and leave you with erectile dysfunction. So like I can't imagine being a young man wanting to, like I'm married, I've been married for a long time, and so uh, it's just a completely different situation. But if you're a young man and you're trying to like hook up with people and you're, like that just seems... To me, that seems like a pretty big deterrent. You know, I, I would be like, ah, I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Uh, I wanna, I wanna fuck with that just yet. And so, there's a lot to consider. Uh, there's a lot to consider. There's um, people think certain things aren't a big deal, like acne and stuff. But if you if you end up with like really bad acne, um, it's uh, it's demoralizing. You know, it it really can be. In terms of uh you know, I guess how they have shaped a lot of stuff. It's, it's kind of unfortunate that anybody with a physique, anybody with any sort of anything, anybody with prowess to be able to sprint really fast, anybody who's really strong, you know, it's people are like, well, the guy's using stuff. Um, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, people almost always assume I, I, as a consumer, you know, I don't think that's necessarily completely negative to think those thoughts, but it's not a. Uh, it's not great because I think it's a. Uh, it's limiting. Like people, people think they need to hop on steroids earlier, and it's like, well, you haven't really. You know, again, I train. I started training when I was like twelve years old. Got more serious about it by the time I was about fifteen. So fifteen to twenty five, I was already training for over ten years. When I decided to take performance enhancing drugs, and looking back at it too, that was also. A little foolish it was a little early i didn't i didn't really need to take them but for myself personally um you know i did a bunch of crazy shit and powerlifting like that i just none of those things would have been possible without performance enhancing drugs so i wouldn't even be who i am today without them uh on the other hand i don't have any idea what i would have been able to turn myself into without them mm -hmm. because i even though i did push for a long time uh without performance enhancing drugs the shape that I'm in right now and the strength that I'm at right now and what I'm doing with running and stuff, I don't know if I would be able to do this uh, without performance, performance enhancing drugs. It seems like I would be able to. Like my blood work, when I get my blood work done, my testosterone levels are normal. So I'm on like TRT dosages nowadays, but I don't really know. And for some people, that might be a real mistake. They might kind of regret not knowing. For me, I don't really regret it because it, it – it just ended up working out really, really well. But I know for some people it doesn't. And then there's also a lot of young men today. You asked about, you asked earlier about anxiety. Um, a lot of people are suffering from like anxiety, restlessness, depression. And uh, I think that performance enhancing drugs, I think steroids, I think would exacerbate that. I think it would make that way worse and it would make what somebody has on their plate uh, even probably harder to manage. So there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to think about when it comes to steroids. I just, I would hope that people, uh, do some of their own research and really look it up and they don't just look at, um, these successful people on the internet, but it's hard cause you got, 
you know, uh, people like myself, uh, you got Greg Doucette, you have Derek, you know, all of us have made really good businesses for ourselves and really good lives for ourselves. Um, I don't, I can't speak for them, but you know, I'm a multimillionaire. I was able to build up some pretty big businesses and business is good and it continues to get better and things continue to grow. And I own everything that I want to own. I've done almost everything I want to do. I, I, I feel really fortunate. Um, so I'm not going to really deter people from steroids, but I just really hope that people do a lot of research on it, look it up and, uh, and really just gain, gain some knowledge about it because, uh, that's something I did from the time I was young. I was always reading about it, always trying to find information about it before I ever even touched them. I think we all just want to know what it could have been if we went the other route. I think it's just a commonality that we all want to have what we can't have or what we don't have. And so the curiosity is always going to be there. So people who have taken PEDs wonder what they would have been like if they stayed natural. People who are natural wonder what we would have been like if we take, took PEDs. Um, but the thing that I don't like about the fitness industry right now, unfortunately, I was very supportive of the transparency, but there's something I've realized that even though I love their content, you know, um, creators such as more plates and great douche, I think unintentionally have created this, uh, this modern age where people believe they're losing hope because they believe everyone's on steroids. Mm. They accuse everyone of being on steroids and now the, the the main comment that we see is we don't want people to believe this person's on steroids because they we don't want them to to we want them to really realize what's achievable you know like we don't want to trick people into thinking what's achievable but last time i remember we were all inspired by anime characters and superheroes and if i can right. recall these people aren't real so i don't really understand what this whole like like, oh, like, we don't want to know what's, you know, we, we should know what's achievable type shit is because people are losing hope and not being discouraged of, you know, going to the going into fitness and bodybuilding and even creating something of themselves. <laughs> I had a podcast yesterday with uh, Tristan Lee, and he was just saying that. Um, shredded. Yeah, super shredded. But he, just like I, shredded. was super, super inspired by Callum Von Mager's vlogs back in the day. But let's be real, you know. We kind of knew, right? So why is it nowadays that now just because someone may be on PDs that their information is not as credible or not as relatable to a natural or like we shouldn't listen to what they do or like they're now discredited or anything like that? Or why should we feel like we have a lack of hope? I just think I just think that part is ridiculous, you know? I think everyone should realize that's like not listening to someone because they're short or not listening to someone because they're way taller than you. Like, it's just, uh, I think it's, I think it's just a way for people to like pair and group and like, you know, people want to, um, they, they want to buy into the person they want to buy into, you know? So the person that it, that they, they believe is natural that is saying that they're natural, um, that's the person that they're interacting with that they're getting their information from and then sometimes yeah they want to go on the per like they shouldn't even if they're not into it they shouldn't even really follow it right mm -hmm. you would think that they wouldn't follow it but they want to be like negative on that other person's uh on that other person's platform uh which is unfortunate and then it makes like anyone that is natural it makes all of them seem like they're liars because there's a lot of natural people like a lot of natural people that are insanely lean or way leaner than people that use. Mm -hmm. There's people that are stronger that are natural than people that use. Uh, there's people that are bigger and more jacked than people that use. So it's like, it's hard to tell. And then anytime you see anybody that has anything worth a shit, you're like, yep, the guy's probably on stuff. I, I agree more with you. I, I have felt that even though I'm, probably one of the first people to ever really talk about it. You know, there's guys that talk about it now uh, and there's people that get some credit for it now, but I talked about it probably 12 or 15 years ago in the movie, bigger, stronger, faster, which was released nationwide in the fucking movie theaters um, talking about it. And I, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of responsibility that comes with talking about it. I think guys like Arnold and a lot of people were kind of hush hush about it. And it's not like Arnold denied it. When he was asked about it, 
he would leak a little information here and there, but he'd only leak out tiny bits and he would be like, yeah, I used a little bit when I competed, you know, and then you hear about those old school cycles and stuff and you're like, mm, <laughs> those were probably fake too. Like there's no way those guys only uh, took those amounts being that big. But again, you could be, you could be right in saying like, just, you know, uh, I don't know. It's it's hard because it's it's easy to go back and forth and see almost both sides of it, where people would be frustrated. I guess the main thing is like I just don't think people want to be lied to, but I do think uh, the transparency of like, hey, this is what we do. This is how we do it. It does cause other people to want to do it. Even something like um, open relationships. Like you hear people talk about open relationships more online. So now there's more, there's probably more open relationships than ever because people talk about it and other people are like, hmm, <laughs> you know, I wonder, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to explore stuff, but in this case, we're talking about drugs and we're talking about literally certain drugs can fall into the wrong person's hand and it can kill them. Uh, steroids are not in that category, like a steroid's not going to necessarily kill you. You're not going to, you can inject an entire bottle of testosterone and, and if anything was going to hurt you at all, it would just be the oil that you shot and you could end up with an infection because that's an awful lot of amount of oil to shoot into your body. Um, you would, you would feel worse if you drank 10 cups of coffee as opposed to taking 10 milliliters of testosterone all at one time. However, we don't know what it's going to do to the kid that is on Ritalin. We don't know what it's going to do to the kid that's had ADHD, the kid that's been made fun of, the kid that's been, he's had A, B, and C already happening to him, and now he takes this, and it's a confidence booster. And um, Or maybe the kid that's that's angry. Maybe the kid that's already angry, and he's he's messing around with uh, things beyond, you know, testosterone, like Trenbolone and, and things like that. And um, I've seen it. I've seen it happen before. I've seen it happen with people where it uh, it just it takes them from being like kind of reckless into being completely reckless. And so while steroids may not like kill somebody and have that kind of impact directly, uh, the indirect impact can be catastrophic. So it's, it's something people really need to be. I wish people just talked more about like, hey, like there's <laughs> there's some fucking caution behind this. I have so many other questions that I want to ask you, but my audience actually had some questions for you if you'd be interested in answering some of them. Yeah. Um, of course, not sure what all questions are here. So if there's any that you don't like, of course, we don't have to answer them as well. Um, Ted asks, what are your uh, what are your future plans for the next five years? Well, Ted, I'm not that organized. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, my son is 19 and my daughter is, uh, she's turning 16 soon. And, um, big goal for me is just to try to suck up as much time with them as I can. So a lot of family oriented stuff, um, family vacations. So we were just talking the other night about a bunch of different plans to travel to some different places and have some different experiences together. Um, beyond that from like a, uh, uh, standpoint of like, I guess, business and stuff. There are some goals, you know, with certain things like, you know, from a running perspective, I have certain goals. Like I'd love to be able to run a marathon in under four hours, um, a half marathon in under two hours and so on. But those are things, those are going to take a little while. And, uh, those are things that are, I would say they're already going to happen. Like I'm already making progress. I'm already heading in that direction. Um, your biceps still look freaking huge for running, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it's a little, a little, a little tough lugging around, lugging around all this muscle. I, I think from a business perspective, I'd love to continue to, you know, uh, innovate and, and bring, bring products to the market that, um, people maybe haven't had a chance to experience before. We actually just made a pair of knee and elbow sleeves recently that, I think people are going to like a lot. Uh, they're just more aesthetically pleasing because a lot of times the elbow sleeves and knee sleeves, they kind of cover like your whole arm. And if you're training like biceps, you don't get to see your bicep. If you're training your triceps, you don't get to see your triceps. So we just, it's a very simple concept. We just made them a lot shorter. And uh, those are called raw sleeves and they're available at markbellslingshot.com if people want to check them out. I've been using your knee sleeves actually for like the last like six years or so. Oh, sick. Yeah, I saw a video of The Rock uh, a couple of days ago doing some like 
Bulgarian split squats and he has his uh, knee sleeve on his shin because he wants to show off the quad for social media. No so I was thinking like he, 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 he needs this, uh, he needs this knee sleeve to, to show off the quads and hammies. Uh, but yeah, just continuing to be innovative and um, bring great products to the market. We've had so much success with my supplement brand, which is called within you. I'm a big believer that, you know, all the answers to life are already kind of inside of us. We just need to, stir some shit up here and there to make the right answers come out. But um, we created a product called the Steak Shake. The Steak Shake has liver, kidney, heart, spleen, pancreas. Uh, it also has beef protein isolate as well as collagen, whey, and egg protein. And people have really loved that. We did a great job nailing down the flavor. There's no artificial sweeteners and stuff like that in there as well. So just kind of continue to expand those brands. And, and um, it's been so much fun, like, just trying to – uh, create new products, make people aware of the products. It's actually, um, it's like, it's kind of difficult. Like when you had a brand for as long as I have to like, I got to continue to tell people about the slingshot, but the slingshot is an idea that I had like 20 years ago. So like, I'm kind of done talking about it, but it's an important thing to continue to share with people because a, we want to sell them, but B, uh, I also think they do provide a lot of value to people. So those are some of the plans in the next couple of years. I really want to grab a slingshot right now. <laughs> I uh, injured both my shoulders and I had shoulder impingement for a long time. So I'm finally just getting back into bench press mm -hmm. after like three years. So sounds like something handy that I want to use. Uh, Rafa asks, I know we were just talking about this actually. Rafa asks craziest cycle he's ever taken. Oh, what's the craziest cycle I've ever taken? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I've done some stuff. I've, uh, I did a shot of testosterone every day for a month just to kind of like see like what would happen. And um, I think my testosterone levels at the end of that, they were already pretty high. They were like, it was like 1200 or something. But at the end of this uh, blasting testosterone every day for 30 days straight, it was like, I want to say it was at like 5,000 or something, like <laughs> 6,000, somewhere in that range. And, uh, I just remember my body was like, my body just kind of like hurt. Uh, I got really like thick. Um, my body just was like stiff though. Like I couldn't move very well. And so I was like, that wasn't really a great idea. Um, I, I've, I've tried a little bit of everything in terms of uh, performance enhancing drugs, insulin, growth hormone, um, testosterone, trenbolone, uh, Anadrol, Anavar, Danabol, all that stuff. Um, I would say probably the, like one of the worst ideas I had was to just oral steroids are just, they're just kind of dirty. Like they just, they have a pretty big impact, but they're, they're not, uh, they're not really worth it. I don't think, especially like Dianabol and Anadrol, the, the, the stronger ones, um, Again, it, it actually made me like perform worse. Like I remember my back would get all pumped up and uh, it just like, I don't know, I'd go to exercise and my body would just like swell up, which was kind of cool. Like it's kind of nice to get like a pump, but it was, uh, it was like painful, <laughs> you know, like my body would like, you know how some of those bodybuilders, they like their, their body just looks like they're in pain. That's probably because they probably are. Cause I certainly was when I was, when I was that big. So not advisable, but that's some of the shit that I did. Gotcha. Cool. Um, Jake asks, what was your favorite PED for strength? I think it's pretty simple. I think, uh, you know, when Stan Efferding got into, when he came over from bodybuilding, uh, he was fresh off of uh, getting his pro card, uh, doing some stuff with uh, Flex Wheeler. And he was like, he's like, what do I take for powerlifting? I was like, test and deca. And then as the contest gets closer, you take a little Diana ball. He's like, really? That's it? I was like, yep, that's it. That's the recipe. So testosterone and DECA or testosterone and something, uh, you know, it could be um, Ecopoise or NPP, some, something to that effect. Um, you know, powerlifting is interesting and strength training is interesting. You actually, you want some of the negative side effects uh, for powerlifting. Like you want to be bloated. Like it's actually <laughs> kind of helpful. So some of the, uh, like when I was at West side barbell, like those guys never took anti-estrogens or they never took anything like that, wow. uh, to, 
counteract, you know, to counteract some of what the testosterone did because you just wanted to be, it didn't matter whether it was bloat or whether it was, uh, you know, good weight or whatever it was, any of all of it was welcome to be able to lift more weight. So <laughs> I'd say testosterone and DECA is really simple. Um, people have been using it for years and I think, uh, DECA from what I remember, uh, also kind of helps, uh, the joints feel pretty. I've never had any experience with these cause a little bit worried about the toxicity, but what are your thoughts on Anadrol and Superdrol for strength? You know, I never tried Superdrol. Anadrol, like again, some of these things, they just, they sound like a great idea because of how potent they are and how strong they are. But, uh, uh, a lot of stuff just gave me like heartburn. And then when you can't eat, it's like hard to, it just makes everything difficult. And, uh, you know, getting so big and stuff too for powerlifting and, and being on some of those uh, orals, they also, they, they make you so big and thick, especially like through like the neck and the traps and stuff that it, that makes your sleep a little harder too. And then you kind of end up with sleep apnea. So uh, a lot of those things, I, I think, you know, what happens is you're, you know, prepping for a contest or something. And, you know, you're, you've got six more weeks to go and you're like, fuck it, man. I'm just going to kind of do whatever I need to do to like lift the most amount of weight on the platform. And then you end up, uh, I don't know, you end up just messing yourself up. You don't need all the extra stuff. It se always seems like you need the extra shit, but, uh, you really don't because when you take those things and it negatively impacts your food and negatively impacts your sleep, it kind of messes you up. I agree with this too. I think there's a big balance and. In the industry right now, everyone's looking at these Reddit forums and bodybuilding forums. And they're like, oh, no, you should be taking like two grams and three grams of gear. So everyone's lying. I'm just like, bro, <laughs> at a certain point, there's like a, what is it? Like marginal diminishing returns. Like you're just going to end up getting three hours of sleep with how much trend you're taking. Yeah, right. Tony asks, how do I increase my squat if I already plateaued and trained once a week? You know, a, a plateau, uh, you know, sometimes just means you have to kind of like switch stuff up a little bit. And so, you know, uh, something as simple as just, you know, squatting like twice a week might be a good idea, breaking it up and um, whatever the normal amount of work is that you do. Like if you normally do like a five by five on, uh, you normally do a five by five once a week. Um, maybe you want to split up those 25 reps or so, I mean, you know, maybe you're going to do three sets of five on Monday and then three sets of five on, um, on Thursday. So now you're, you're spreading out, it's called spreading the fatigue. You're taking out the, uh, you're not just hammering it all in one day. You're spreading it over two days, um, without knowing too much more about like your particular squat workouts, I would say. One of the things that always stuck with me was the idea that uh, the best program is the one that you're currently not doing. So if you've been on the low rep side for a while, mm. spend a month or so, you know, doing sets of eight and sets of six and sets of 10. And um, when you go back to doing your lower reps, um, you know, get into your reps of three and your reps of two and your singles and stuff, uh, do that over a period of time as well. Like maybe take a month where you're doing your higher reps and take another month where you're easing your way back into working your way towards doubles and singles and your strength should go through the roof just because all of that is, is so different and new for you. And then when you're doing your repetitions, um, I always liked a lot of the stuff from Jim Wendler in five, three, one, where Jim talks about like when you do a set of five, like it should be really clean. All five reps should look the same. Your last rep, uh, should look a lot like your first rep and your last rep of your last set should look like the first rep of your first set. So those are all things that really, to really, uh, put in the front of your mind for your powerlifting workouts. You know, if you're used to doing like a five by five or, you know, six sets of three or something like that, like your last couple of reps on your last set should look the same as the first couple of reps of your first set. And that, that's a hard principle to like follow because you want to go heavier. Uh, but any deviations in your form, like don't go by the video. Like the videos are good. Like video your stuff. It's important. But go by how you feel because you can't see the nuances uh, when, you look, when you look at the video. You won't see that your back slightly rounded. Like you just can't tell unless it's like a huge deviation from the form. But go by how you feel. I think a good 
reference point for that is when you're doing the lift, can you actually think and can you actually feel and pay attention to your body? If you go to on rack a weight and you're like, oh shit, I'm going to die. <laughs> the weight's way too heavy. Or if it just compresses you down and you're like all forward in this weird position and you're having a really hard time maintaining posture and maintaining form, then uh, you have to uh, reduce the weight. So those are some of the tips and tricks that I've utilized quite a bit over the years. Jacob, Jacob asks, have you ever used SARMs? I have. I have used, um, I used GW, I used Carterine. Uh, Carterine is something I was using when I, when I first started getting into running. Does that even really like, like qualify as a SARM? I don't think officially it's a SARM, but yeah, it's in some sort of category of something. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you ever tried a but, what is uh, it, SR nine thousand yeah. nine? Mm, I don't think so. Okay, I think I think I believe that that's um, it. Inter it it acts similar to cardarine and um, increases your cardio output, but it does so by reacting with your circadian rhythm. It's interesting. Yeah, all that stuff is really fascinating. Uh, we're supposed to have a guy on the show um, on our podcast coming up. Uh, he is one of the like creators of SARMs, which like I didn't know where the fuck SARMs came from, but uh, got contacted by this guy, and I'm like, this sounds really interesting. I guess initially, like it, some of the stuff was created to uh, try to have more of a direct impact on uh, people's like strength without it being like a hormonal disruption. And on paper, they were trying to create something that they basically could sell to like elderly people. Uh, so they didn't fall and break their hip and stuff like that so they could be stronger. And I guess some of these ha like were pretty effective, but the safety of them is still like kind of up in the air. People don't aren't really sure exactly what they do and don't do. And there's been a lot of reports of people getting like their testosterone and their cholesterol and stuff checked after having SARMs and their testosterone is in like the bucket. Like it's like almost not recognizable for some reason. Um, but then these people that, their testosterone's low. They're still like strong as shit. So it, I was it, super fascinating. Um, I think that the information from stuff like that and the research from stuff like that, I think is, is going to lead us down a really good path in the future. But uh, the verdict is still kind of out on SARMs for now. It definitely seemed like they work pretty good. I agree. Um, they definitely are not something I've experienced with though. So for me, I'm, uh, I guess I'm a little sus about them at the moment. <laughs> I wouldn't take them over. I wouldn't take them over steroids though. You know, I wouldn't, that's the thing is like, I think that SARMs can be effective, but I, I, if you're thinking about using them, like I would use them in conjunction with like some testosterone, you know, uh, I think they would be way more effective. I actually think that a couple of things, I think you could take a, you could probably take a little less testosterone if you're on some of these SARMs and B, you could probably take a little bit less of the, of the SARMs as well. So you could end up, that's the whole point of a stack. You know, the whole point of a cycle is that you're trying to get the benefits of like testosterone. You're trying to get the benefits of DECA uh, without all the negative sides that come along with it. But somewhere along the line, we lost sight of that. So rather than taking a hundred of each or a hundred milligrams of testosterone and 50 milligrams of DECA, uh, that, that turned into like, Oh, I take, you know, 200 milligrams of test. So I'll take 200 milligrams of DECA with it. And I'll do that like three times a week. <laughs> like, oh, that turned that that just that cycle turned into something quite different, real fast. So I have two last questions for you. Um, first one is, what's the biggest lesson you learned throughout your life? Uh, I'll say, you know, one of the bigger lessons I've learned. There's just so many. I guess if I'm going to pinpoint it down to one, uh, I think just really taking your time. Like, just take your time with. If you really take your time with stuff. Uh, almost doesn't matter what it is. Like if you're just going slower, it's easy to make corrections. If you're going slower, it's easier to tell someone that you miscommunicated, that you didn't mean to hurt their feelings, that you're sorry, that you're, you know, if you're, if you're taking things nice and easy, it's, it's, ev it makes everything in my opinion, a little easier. It's hard when you're going a hundred miles an hour. So be patient, take your time with stuff. I mean, even just thinking about lifting, 
it's really, really easy to get hurt in the gym. Really easy to get hurt. But if you take your time, it's really hard to actually get hurt. Like imagine if, imagine if week one in the gym, you just commit to like, I'm going to use a barbell for a bunch of different barbell exercises, but I'm not even going to load it with weight. That's week one. Week two, I'm going to put five pounds on each side of the bar and I'm going to, you know, do a bent over row and an overhead press and a bench press and a squat. I don't care what other people think if they think it looks silly or funny. I'll learn these movements and watch these YouTube videos. I'm going to learn. If you take your time with stuff, it's just so much harder to get hurt. Uh, the same thing goes with running. Um, so, yeah, it, it seems like it's going to always seem like you have to go faster. Um, but going faster is an illusion and it will take you longer to, to try to go faster on stuff anyway. So just go really fucking slow. I think that's an amazing answer. I think a lot of the times we are, we're always in a rush trying to get to the next place, trying to get next, get to the next stage. And many of us don't really realize that in doing so we run the risk of injuring ourselves or giving ourselves setbacks. Uh, this is seen everywhere man. and everything that we're doing even as easily as just going to the gym and not warming up enough before before a, uh, before a set which right. is how all of us you know get shoulder impingement pull something the works so or what about your uh shaker cup exploding all over your car you know <laughs> <laughs> going too fast today you shake it up not paying attention and like you i don't know you somehow drop it or something and it just goes everywhere it, like ruins your life it takes forever. You'll never get that smell out of your car. You'll be screwed. That's why I think, uh, just like you said, you know, taking it slow and then consistency is the name of the game. That's why the amount of days in the books of doing it right rather than how hard and how fast and how much you can eat all at once is, is the name mm -hmm. of the game. Last question. Um, if you were to die tomorrow and you had one message that you could broadcast to the world, what would the message be that you'd like to send? And you're coming at me with some hard questions. I would just have to go with what I always say. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. <laughs> Let's go. Get you guys later. <laughs> Thanks for being on the podcast, man. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Where can everybody find you? I'm at Mark Smelly Bell on Instagram. And then also check out markbellslingshot.com and check out withinyoubrand.com as well to check out some of my supplements awesome thank, thank you so you, man. much man thanks everybody um if you want to support the podcast which will help us get amazing guests such as mark today then you can do so by rating us five stars on anywhere you find your podcast or spot or uh, subscribe to the youtube channel and then finally if you want to support the podcast as well you can help support the podcast by using code discount nile off of young la clothing and huge supplements thanks again mark appreciate it thank you see you next time all right man later